Hello everybody, my name is Peter Klapper from the School of Biosciences at the University of Kent in Canterbury and in this video clip I want to discuss with you how enzymes react to temperature and we want to discuss the temperature dependency of enzymes and why it actually happens. So let's have a look how enzymes behave at, uh, at different temperatures. And we just simply take an enzyme from, uh, let's say, humans. And what we will see is that uh, the, the enzyme at low temperature doesn't show a lot of activity. Only when the temperature goes up, we reach activity uh, we reach a peak and then very quickly the enzyme becomes inactive. So at so here we have the temperature, here we've got the activity, low temperature, not a lot going on, increasing the temperature, the activity goes up and up and up and down. And then we come to a point where the activity goes completely down. Now for humans, this is around, say, 35 to about 42 degrees centigrade. So what is going on here? So how do we have to think about this temperature effect? Well, the easiest way to imagine that is that, let's say here is our enzyme and here is the active site. And here I've got a substrate. Now, of course, this substrate can fit into the active site and the enzyme can do something with it. So that's the theory at good temperatures. Now, what's happening at a low temperature? At a very low temperature, our active site here, this thing here, is fairly rigid. There's not a lot happening. So the enzyme Although it can bind to the substrate, it, it doesn't hold on to the substrate like that. And the substrate can very easily fall out. If we increase the temperature now, what happens is that the active site, that the whole molecule, the whole protein molecule, is starting to move a little bit. The side chains in the amino acids of this protein of this enzyme are moving around. So now the substrate comes in and it the, the amino acid chains move around and they hold the substrate. So at a higher temperature, the protein is, and we call this, the protein is breathing. It's moving around. The residues in the protein are moving around. Now we increase the temperature even more and the side chains are moving even more. And that, there comes a point where the protein moves so much that the substrate cannot bind anymore. And if we heat it up too much, another, subst an, another uh, active site, another enzyme might come along and they just get completely messed up like this. So what's very important uh, to understand is that Proteins are not rigid structures. They are moving around. The amino acids in the proteins are moving around. And when they move at exactly the right speed, this enzyme is at its best. It is at its uh, most active. So this means we cannot have the enzyme too rigid because then it would not hold on to the substrate and we cannot have the enzyme too strongly moving around because then it can't hold on to the enzyme uh, to the substrate again so we need to have the right movement of the protein so that it can bind the substrate so when we looked earlier at the temperature of a human enzyme and looked at the activity curve. We found that at low temperature here, not a lot is going on. And this is due because the enzyme does not move around. It does not breathe enough to hold on to the, to, to the substrate properly. 
and to catalyze the reaction. When we increase the temperature, the enzyme starts breathing more. It starts moving around. The residues in the enzyme move around. And it reaches its optimum temperature around, well, this is usually in the area of um, 35 to 40 degrees. But if it gets hotter than 42 or 43 degrees, many enzymes just simply fall apart. And uh, we call this the enzyme or the protein denatures. It is no longer in its functional three-dimensional correct structure. It just simply falls apart. Now, this is the uh, curve for a typical mesophilic organism. So, mesophil. Mesophil means this organism grows very well at medium temperatures in the range of 35 to 40 degrees. But of course, we know of organisms that like it cold. So, for them, it would look like something like that. So they might have a temperature optimum at, say, 15 degrees. So this curve shows that if it is too cold, not a lot happens. But then, very rapidly, the enzyme starts breathing, even at low temperatures. It starts breathing. It starts moving around. and it reaches its peak performance, and then it moves too much. It moves too fast and can no longer do uh, what the enzyme is supposed to do. And it denatures, and it denatures at a much lower temperature as, for example, the mesophyll uh, organism. So these uh, organisms are usually called, they are called psychrophilic. Psychro means cold. So these are psychrophils. And of course, there are also organisms that like it really hot. So even at 40 degrees, let's say, oh, I want to change the, I want to change the color. Even at 40 degrees, it's too cold for these enzymes. But if we heat them up, then they are in the right environment. They start breathing at high temperatures. Only at high temperatures they start moving around and are flexible enough to do the activity, to show uh, a catalytic function. And these, uh, these uh, temperatures might be up to, well, they could be up to 90 or 100 degrees centigrade. So these organisms are called thermophils. Thermophils. Thermo means hot. They like it hot. And what happens is that for each enzyme, the enzymes are adapted to the right temperature of their uh, environment. Now, when we compare psychrophilic enzymes, so psychrophilic with thermophilic enzymes, what we find is that psychrophilic enzymes are usually, their structure is rather loose like that. So the protein structure is fairly open and flexible. And this allows the protein to breathe, to breathe at low temperatures, at low temperatures. So the act the enzyme is already active at lower temperature because it can move around since the structure is very flexible. 
and we see that because there are lots of loops around there are not many structures in the protein like for example uh, salt bridges or something like that where that hold the protein in a rigid position now if we compare that to our thermophilic proteins so we have thermophil what well, we see that the the proteins that are adapted for thermophilic activity are usually much tighter the structure of these proteins are very tight so that means that they only start to breathe the right amount so breathe at high temperatures at low temperatures they don't breathe at all only when the temperature is very high they start to breathe in the, the right amount so that the enzyme can hold on to the uh, to the substrate so in this case the thermophilic protein is really tightly packed and this is very often achieved by lots of salt bridges sitting there in the in the protein uh, which give the protein additional stability uh, very often you don't have lots of loops you have secondary structure elements that are tightly packed together so that is usually the difference between the psychophilic and the thermophilic protein and what is very important is that for every enzyme that we use we try to find out what is the best temperature range where is the at which temperature is the enzyme most active is it a psychophilic enzyme then we have to work at low temperature temperatures is it a mesophilic enzyme well then we can work at room temperature or even elevated temperature 35 degrees or something like that if it is a thermophilic enzyme then we have to work with this enzyme at very high temperatures so for example 90 or even 100 degrees and I think one of the organisms that's the, the that that is a, sort of the world record holder in this organism the enzyme really works at very high temperature 125 degrees now when we talk about these enzymes we see that they have different temperature requirements but what's even more interesting is that there are whole organisms that have adapted to these temperatures and as I said the world record holder is at 125 degrees this is a whole organism this means that all the enzymes in this organism are adjusted to work best at this high temperature and on the other hand of uh, at the other side of the spectrum we have organisms that work best at minus temperatures uh, at minus two minus three degrees they are at the most active now humans are obviously in the middle and uh, we say that these organisms the psychophilic organisms and the thermophilic or the super thermophilic organisms they are what we call extremophiles they are living organisms at temperatures that are completely unimaginable for us so we see them as extremophiles but it could also be that these organisms would see us as extremophiles so for a psychophilic organism which works best at at two degrees or, or five degrees or something like that this organism would see us humans when we work best at 35 degrees it would see us as a thermophilic organism whereas a, super, uh, a thermophilic organism would see us as a psychophilic organism so it always depends on the point of view now why is that interesting well so far uh, before we discovered these extremophiles we thought that life is only possible in the range of well let's say 20 to 40 degrees 
and that is a quite a narrow span. But now we know that life is even possible at 120 degrees or at below zero temperatures. And that is quite a, an exciting, uh, an exciting thought because we now can imagine that there might be life out there in space that although it is not exactly where we would expect life temperatures between 20 and 40 degrees, it could very well be that there are places, there are planets, there are moons out there in space that have the temperature for some extremophiles. And the interesting thing is that the most interesting candidate in our solar system is not Mars, it is probably uh, Europa, which is a moon that orbits around Jupiter. Because we know that there is an ocean under the icy surface of this moon. And we believe that there is liquid water, but it's very cold there. And uh, up until about 50 years ago, people said, no, there is no life possible because life cannot exist at uh, sub-zero temperatures. But now we know that life is possible at low temperatures because the enzymes have adapted. They are very flexible in these organisms so they can breathe at even low temperatures. So it's no longer impossible to find life outside Earth and we just have to look for it. So I hope this makes sense and thank you for watching.